Bedtime Reading The Hound of the Baskervilles Chapter 1 The Beginning of the Case It was a beautiful September morning. The sky was blue and the air cool and fresh. The sun shone warmly into the windows of my house on Baker Street in London. I had just finished eating breakfast and was enjoying the day's newspaper. My friend and partner Holmes, who usually slept later than I did, was still eating. A man was coming to see us at 10.30, and I wondered if Holmes would finish eating his boiled egg and porridge before our visitor arrived. But Holmes did not seem to be in a hurry. He was reading a letter. It was from a doctor named James Mortimer, who wanted to meet with Holmes. Well, Watson, Holmes said to me, perhaps Dr. Mortimer's case will not be very interesting for us. His letter tells us nothing about his problem, but he says it is very important. I hope that we can help him in some way. At exactly 10.30, there was a knock on the front door. Excellent, said Holmes. Clearly, this Dr. Mortimer is a man who will not waste our valuable time. We stood up as a servant brought our visitor into the sitting room. Good morning, gentlemen, he said. I am Dr. James Mortimer, from the town of Grimpen in Devonshire. And you must be Mr. Sherlock Holmes. As the two men shook hands, Holmes said, it is a pleasure to meet you, Dr. Mortimer. This is my friend and partner, Dr. John Watson. Certainly, said Mortimer, as he turned to me and shook hands. This strange story I am about to discuss with you is very difficult. If it will help for Dr. Watson to listen to the conversation, then he should stay. Although he lived in the English countryside, Mortimer looked like an educated city man. He was very tall and thin. His gray eyes shone brightly with intelligence, and he wore small, thin, golden glasses. However, his clothing was old and worn, like a countryman's. His face was young, but very tired and worried-looking. He took some papers from his pocket and said, Mr. Holmes, I need your help and advice. There is a strange and frightening mystery that must be solved. Sit down, Dr. Mortimer, said Holmes, and tell us about it. Would you like some tea? Chapter 2 The Strange Letter A man named Sir Charles Baskerville gave me these papers, said Dr. Mortimer. He told me they were extremely important. Sadly, Sir Charles died suddenly three months ago. His death caused much sadness and excitement in Devonshire, where I am from. Sir Charles's family has a great house there, Baskerville Hall. Before I read this paper to you, I will first tell, Sir Charles was a reasonable man, but he believed the strange story that is told in these papers. Dr. Mortimer went on. The story is about the Baskerville family. I have come to see you, Mr. Holmes, because I think you may be able to help. I think that something terrible is going to happen in the next twenty-four hours. But, of course, you can't help me unless you know the story of the Baskerville family. May I read it to you? Certainly, Dr. Mortimer, said Holmes. Then he lit his pipe and sat back in his chair with his eyes shut. Mortimer began to read the papers in his high, rather strange voice. It is the year 1742. I... William Baskerville am writing this paper for my sons. It was my father who first told me about the Hound of the Baskervilles. This hound is a very large and terrible dog. I want you, 
my sons, to read this story and never forget it. I want you to know that God punishes those who do evil. But God forgives people who are sorry for the wrong things they have done. Over a hundred years ago, in 1640, the head of the Baskerville family was Sir Hugo Baskerville. He was a strange and evil man. He had a cruel heart and enjoyed hurting other people. One day Sir Hugo saw a young woman, the daughter of a farmer who lived close by. He decided he wanted her for his own. This girl was very afraid of the evil Sir Hugo and tried to hide from him. One day, Hugo heard that this girl's father and brothers were away. He knew that she would be alone in the house. So he rode to the farm with five or six of his friends, who were just as terrible as he was. They made the girl return to Baskerville Hall with them, and locked her in a room upstairs. Then they sat down in another room to drink. As usual, they drank many bottles of wine and became very drunk. Then they began to sing loud songs. The young girl was alone upstairs. When she heard the terrible songs Sir Hugo and his men were singing, she knew she had to escape, or she would die. So she opened the window and used the vines on the wall to climb down to the ground. Then she started to run across the moor, a large field full of hills and stones, to her home. Some time later, Sir Hugo left his friend sitting downstairs and went up to see the girl. When he saw that she was gone, he was extremely angry. He ran down the stairs. He yelled, If I catch that girl before she gets home, I'll give my soul to the devil. I think Sir Hugo really would have done this, and he was so evil. Hugo's friends laughed and told him to send his dogs to chase the girl. After he let the dogs go, he jumped onto his black horse and rode off after the dogs, which were barking loudly. After they had drunk even more wine, Hugo's friends thought it would be fun to help Sir Hugo find the girl. So they got on their horses and followed him. There were thirteen of them on the road. After a mile or two they passed an old farmer and asked him if he had seen Sir Hugo and his dogs. The man was pale and shaking with fear and could hardly speak. He said, Yes, I've seen that poor girl with the terrible hounds running close behind her. Sir Hugo was with the hounds screaming terrible things at the young lady. But I have seen more than that, the old man cried. Behind Sir Hugo I saw another hound, a hound like no other in the world. It was black and terrible, and almost as large as a horse. It was running silently, and its eyes were red and hungry-looking. God protected me from that hound of hell. Sir Hugo's friends just laughed at the old man and called him a stupid fool. Then they rode away. But then they saw Sir Hugo's horse running towards them. Sir Hugo was not riding it. The men said to each other, Maybe he's fallen off the horse, they laughed. But they were suddenly afraid, so they kept their horses close together. They rode their horses over the moor until they found the hounds. Everyone in this part of England knew about the famous Baskerville hounds. They were the bravest, strongest, and the best at hunting in Devonshire. But when Sir Hugo's friends found them, the hounds were standing at the edge of a deep valley. They seemed very frightened of something and would not move. Most of Sir Hugo's friends were too scared to go down into this valley, but at last three men agreed to go. The valley had a wide, flat floor. In the middle of the flat ground two large stones stood. 
thousands of years ago, some people had put them there. The moon was shining brightly on the large stones, and between them, on the ground, lay the girl. She was dead, but there were no marks on her body. Sir Hugo's body lay next to her. But it was not the sight of these two dead people that made the men afraid. It was the sight of the huge animal that was standing over Sir Hugo. It was a great black animal that looked like a hound. But it was larger than any hound they had ever seen. As the three men stared in horror, the hound tore out Hugo Baskerville's throat. Then it turned towards them. Its eyes were burning brightly. The hound's body shone with a strange light. Blood ran from its mouth, and it licked its teeth with a long tongue. The teeth were like knives, long and sharp. The men screamed. They rode back up the valley as fast as they could go. They were almost beating their horses because they were so afraid. Later that night, one died from the horror he had seen. The other two were insane for the rest of their lives. That was the first time the hound appeared, my sons. It has been seen many times since then, and many of the Baskervilles have died in strange and terrible ways. I believe there is a curse on our family. Because of this, you must not travel on the moor at night. You are Baskervilles, and the devil finds it easy to do his work when the world is dark. Surely this hound is one of his creatures. Chapter 3 The Death of Sir Charles Baskerville When Dr. Mortimer had finished reading this strange story, he looked across at Sherlock Holmes. I was surprised to see that Holmes looked bored, but also looked as if he thought the letter was funny. "'Do you think this is an interesting story, Mr. Holmes?' asked Dr. Mortimer. Holmes laughed. "'My dear sir, only a storyteller or a child would find this story interesting.' Dr. Mortimer did not answer him. Instead, he took a newspaper from another pocket in his coat. Now, Mr. Holmes, let me read you something else. This was written only three months ago. It is from the Devonshire County newspaper, and it is about the death of Sir Charles Baskerville. Holmes looked more interested. Dr. Mortimer began to read. People in Devonshire County feel much sadness at the terrible death of Sir Charles Baskerville. Sir Charles was an extremely good man, although he had lived at Baskerville Hall for only two years. Everyone in the area liked him very much, because of the great help he gave to the people of Devonshire. Sir Charles had lived in a foreign land and made his money there. He returned to England to repair Baskerville Hall and the villages around it. These places were old and in very bad condition, but with Sir Charles's help they became beautiful once again. He was a friendly and kind man who gave much help to the poor. It is unfortunate that the police report on Sir Charles's death does not tell us everything that happened. However, we can be sure that he was not murdered. The strange stories the village people tell about his death are not true. His friend and doctor, Dr. James Mortimer, said that Sir Charles' heart had been weak for a long time. It is likely that he died of a sudden heart attack. The facts of this death are simple. Every evening, Sir Charles went for a walk in the gardens of Baskerville Hall. His favorite place to walk was down a path between two rows of trees. This path is the famous Yew Alley of Baskerville Hall. On the night of June 4th, he went out to walk and to smoke his cigar, as he often did. Sir Charles was going to London the next morning, and Barrymore, 
his head servant, was inside the house packing his suitcases. But by midnight, Barrymore realized that Sir Charles had not returned. So he went to look for him. He saw that the door of the house was open. That day had been rainy and wet, so Barrymore could see the footprints left by Sir Charles's shoes as he had walked down the path of trees. Halfway down this path is a gate which leads to the moor. There were signs that Sir Charles had stood at this gate for some time before continuing his walk. Barrymore followed the footprints to the end of the path, and there he found Sir Charles's body. Barrymore told the police an interesting detail about these footprints. He said that they changed between the gate leading to the moor and the end of the path of trees. As far as the moor gate, all the footprints were normal. But Barrymore saw only toe prints in the ground after Sir Charles passed this gate. Barrymore thought that Sir Charles had walked on his toes. A man called Murphy, who buys and sells horses, was close to Baskerville Hall when Sir Charles died. This man is known in the town for his drunkenness, and that night he had been drinking a lot of beer as usual. However, he swore that he heard someone shouting, as if they were calling for help. The shouts came from the direction of Baskerville Hall. Dr. James Mortimer was asked to come and look at Sir Charles's body. After he examined the body, Dr. Mortimer decided that Sir Charles had not been murdered. However, Dr. Mortimer told police that Sir Charles had a look on his face of surprise and fear. But Dr. Mortimer decided this was normal. Sir Charles's weak heart had failed suddenly, and this had caused his death. Now that Sir Charles is dead, there will be a new head of the Baskerville family. He will own Baskerville Hall. The people of Devonshire hope very much that this person will move into Baskerville Hall as soon as possible. The people would like Sir Charles's good work in this area to continue. The new head of the Baskerville family is a man named Sir Henry Baskerville. At this time, we do not know if Sir Henry is still alive, or if the lawyers can find him. He is the son of Sir Charles Baskerville's younger brother, who died some years ago. This young man has been living in the United States of America. At this time, the Baskerville lawyers are trying to find him, to tell him of his inheritance. The article was finished. Dr. Mortimer put the newspaper back into his pocket. Well, Mr. Holmes, those are the facts about the death of Sir Charles. Everyone knows these things, he said. Thank you for reading me this paper, Dr. Mortimer. It is very interesting to me, Holmes said. I read about Sir Charles's death in our London newspaper, but I did not know the details. The newspaper gives us the facts that everybody knows. Now I want you to tell me all the other facts that only you know. What do you really think about Sir Charles's death, Dr. Mortimer? Dr. Mortimer sighed. I haven't told anyone what I really think, he said. I am a man of science, as you know. I have always believed that there is a good reason for everything, and certainly I did not want to say anything that might stop Sir Henry from going to Baskerville Hall. But I will tell you some things that were not in the report. In the months before his death, Dr. Mortimer went on, Sir Charles was extremely worried and nervous. His body was near to breaking down, I think, you see, no matter what I told him, he believed the story of the Hound of the Baskervilles. He was certain that the Hound would find and kill him, as it had killed Sir Hugo. He believed the Baskerville family was cursed because of Sir Hugo's evil acts. He would not go out on the moor at night. Often, 
he would ask me if I had heard the howl of a hound on the moor at night. He was always very excited and nervous when he asked this question. About three weeks before Sir Charles died, I went to Baskerville Hall. As I drove up to the house, Sir Charles was standing at the door as if he was meeting me. I went up to him, but he did not say hello. There was a look of horror on his face, and he was staring at something behind me. I turned around quickly and saw something moving between the trees. It looked like a small black cow. Sir Charles was so frightened that he looked as if he would die that minute. I went to look for the animal, to make him feel better. However, it had disappeared. I stayed with Sir Charles all that evening. It was then he gave me the old papers I have just read to you. Mr. Holmes, Sir Charles' behavior that evening may be important when you think about what happened on the night of his death. When Barrymore, the head servant, found Sir Charles's body, he sent someone to get me. I examined Sir Charles's body. No one had killed him. All the things in the newspaper I have just read to you are true. But Barrymore made a mistake. He said that there were no other footprints on the ground around Sir Charles's body. He did not notice any. But I did. These prints were not close to the body, but they were large and very clear. Were they a man's or a woman's footprints? asked Holmes. Dr. Mortimer looked at us for a moment. Mr. Holmes, they were the footprints of a huge hound. Chapter 4 The Problem When Mortimer spoke these words, I knew the case was ours. Holmes sat up in his chair, and his eyes showed he was very interested in the mystery. Why did nobody else see this hound's footprints? he asked. The footprints were about twenty meters from the body. Nobody thought to look so far away, Mortimer replied. Are there many sheepdogs on the moor? asked Holmes. Yes, there are. But this was no sheepdog. I know what a sheepdog's feet look like. These footprints were very large indeed. Enormous, Mortimer answered. But whatever the animal was, it had not gone near Sir Charles, Holmes said. That's right. What was the weather like on that night? Holmes asked. It was wet and cold, although it wasn't raining. Describe the path of trees that Sir Charles walked along to me. It is the famous yew alley of Baskerville Hall. It is quite peaceful and beautiful. There is a path between two long lines of yew trees. These trees were planted very close together. Down the middle is a path of small stones. The path has grass on each side of it, said the doctor. I understand that in one place there is a gate that leaves the path, said Holmes. Yes, there is a small gate which leads to the moor. Is there any other opening through the line of trees? No. So, you can enter or leave the yew alley only from the hall or through the moor gate, asked Holmes. There is a way out through a summer house at the end of the path. Had Sir Charles reached the summer house? No. He lay about fifty meters from it, said Mortimer. Now, Dr. Mortimer, this is important. You say that the footprints you saw were on the path and not on the grass. No footprints could show on the grass, said Mortimer. Were they on the same side of the path as the moorgate? Yes, they were. I think that is very interesting. Another question. 
Was the gate to the moor closed? Yes, it was closed and locked. How high is the gate? asked Holmes. It is very small. So a person could climb over it. Tell me about the footprints you saw by the moor gate. Sir Charles seems to have stood there for five or ten minutes, said Mortimer. I know that because the footprints were very deep. Also, his cigar had burned down, and the ash had dropped off the end of it. Excellent, said Holmes. This man is a very good detective, Watson. Sir Charles had left his footprints all over that little bit of the path where he was standing. I could not see any other prints. Sherlock Holmes smiled. I like to look closely at these things myself, he said. Dr. Mortimer, you should have come to me immediately. Mr. Holmes, the best detective in the world cannot help with some things, the doctor said. You mean. Things that do not follow the laws of science, supernatural things, asked Holmes. I do not know, replied the doctor. I only know what I have been told. Before Sir Charles died, people have told me some very serious things. Several people have seen an animal running on the moor at night. It looks like an enormous hound. Everyone agrees that it was a huge creature. Larger than any dog could be. And, Mr. Holmes, the animal shone with a strange light, like a ghost. I have questioned these people carefully. None of them are crazy or drink too much. They all tell exactly the same story. Although these people have not seen the thing up close, it is exactly like the hellhound of the Baskerville story. The people are very frightened. And only the bravest man will cross the moor at night. And you, a man of science, believe that the creature is supernatural, a ghost, or something from another world? asked Holmes. I don't know what I believe, said Dr. Mortimer. But surely, doctor, you must think that the footprints were made by a living animal, not a ghost. When the hound first appeared two hundred and fifty years ago, it was real enough to tear out Sir Hugo's throat and kill him. But the animal was a strange and frightening hellhound, said Dr. Mortimer. Dr. Mortimer, if you and the people of Devonshire really believe that Sir Charles's death was caused by a ghost, my detective work cannot help you, Holmes said seriously. Maybe this is true, said Mortimer. But you can help by advising me what to do for Sir Henry Baskerville, even if you cannot help more. Dr. Mortimer looked at his watch. He arrives in London on the train in little over an hour. Sir Henry is now the head of the Baskerville family, asked Holmes. Yes, said Dr. Mortimer. He is the last of the Baskervilles. The family lawyers have found him in America and told him everything. He has come to England immediately by ship. He landed this morning. Now, Mr. Holmes, what do you think I should tell him to do? Why doesn't he just go to the family home? asked Holmes. Because, Mr. Holmes, too many Baskervilles have died horrible deaths there. No matter what the reason is, This is a plain fact. Perhaps we would be putting Sir Henry in too much danger. But Sir Charles's good work must go on. If it does not, then all the people on the Baskerville lands will be much poorer. If the Baskerville family leaves the hall, the whole area will be ruined. I don't know what to do. That is why I came to you for advice. Holmes thought for a few moments. Then he said, You think it is too dangerous for any Baskerville to live at the hall because of this terrible hound. I think you should go and meet Sir Henry Baskerville at the train station. 
Do not tell him anything about our discussion. In twenty-four hours, I will tell you what I think you should do. At ten o'clock tomorrow morning, I would like you to bring Sir Henry Baskerville here. Dr. Mortimer got up from his chair and shook hands with both of us. As he was leaving the room, Holmes said, One more question, Dr. Mortimer. You said that before Sir Charles's death, there were other people who saw this strange animal on the moor. Yes, said Mortimer. Since Sir Charles's death, has anyone seen the animal? I do not know of anyone who has seen it. Thank you, Dr. Mortimer. Good morning. After Mortimer had left us, Holmes sat down in his chair. He looked pleased and immediately asked for his pipe. He always acted this way when a case interested him. I knew that he wanted to think about everything he had heard. So I left the house and went out for the day. When I came back, the room was full of thick, sweet-smelling smoke from Holmes' pipe. Well, Holmes, what do you think of the story? Have you solved the mystery? I asked him, smiling. It is hard to say. Take, for example, the change in the footprints. Did Sir Charles walk on his toes down the path of trees? Why would he do that? That would be ridiculous. The truth is he was running. Running for his life. He ran until his heart stopped from fear, Watson. He was frightened to death. What was he running from? I asked. That is the difficult question, said Holmes. I think he was frightened by something and began to run. He was so scared that he didn't know what he was doing. That explains why he ran away from the house instead of towards it, where he would be safe. Then there is another question. Who was he waiting for that night? And why would he meet this person in the path of trees, the yew alley, and not in the house like a normal person? You think he was waiting for someone? Sir Charles was old and rather sick. We know why he took a walk each evening. It was for his health. But why did he stand in the cold on wet ground for five or ten minutes? Dr. Mortimer cleverly saw the cigar ash on the ground, so we know how long Sir Charles stood there. And, Watson, we know that he was deathly afraid of being outside at night because of his belief in the Hound of the Baskervilles. So it is extremely unlikely that he waited at the moor gate every evening. He must have been there for a special reason. I am beginning to understand some things, Watson. But I will say nothing until we meet Sir Henry Baskerville in the morning. Now, please give me my violin. I found Holmes' violin, and he began to play. He had done all the thinking he could. Now he needed more details of the case to help him. Chapter 5 Sir Henry Baskerville At ten o'clock the next morning, Dr. Mortimer and Sir Henry Baskerville arrived at the house. Sir Henry was a healthy, strong-looking man. His face showed that he had a strong character. He also looked like a kind man, like his relative Sir Charles had been. He wore a country suit of thick red-brown fabric, and his skin showed that he spent most of his time in the fresh air. "'I am very glad to have this meeting with you, Mr. Holmes,' Sir Henry said, after we had shaken hands with our visitors. "'I need your help. I received a very strange letter this morning.' He put a piece of paper on the table. On it were the words, "'Do not go to Baskerville Hall, but if you do—' Do not go on to the moor, I beg you. If you do, your life will be in danger. 
there was no handwriting. Instead, the words of the letter had been cut out of a newspaper. Can you tell me, Mr. Holmes, what this means, and who is so interested in me? Sir Henry asked. Holmes looked at the letter closely. This is very interesting, said Holmes. Look how badly the letter has been made. I think the writer was in a hurry. Why? Perhaps because he did not want anyone to know what he was doing. When he wrote the address on the letter, the pen and the ink he used gave the writer some problems. You see, the pen has gotten dry three times in writing a short address. There was probably very little ink in the bottle. A private pen and bottle of ink are never allowed to get into that condition. So I think this letter must have been written in a hotel or some public area. Hello, what's this? He was holding the letter only a few centimeters from his eyes. Well, I asked. It's nothing, he said, and put the letter down. Now, Sir Henry, do you have anything else to tell us? No, said Sir Henry, except that I have lost one of my shoes. Last night I put a pair of shoes outside my door. I wanted the hotel to clean them, but when I went to get them this morning, one of them was gone. I only bought the shoes yesterday, and I have never worn them. Isn't that strange, Mr. Holmes? One shoe is a silly thing to steal, said Holmes. I am sure the shoe will be found in the hotel and returned to you. But now we must tell you some things about the Baskerville family. Dr. Mortimer took out the old Baskerville papers and read them to Sir Henry. Then Holmes told him everything we knew about the death of Sir Charles. So this letter is from someone who is trying to warn me or frighten me away from Baskerville Hall, said Sir Henry. Yes, said Holmes. And we must decide if you can go to Baskerville Hall. There seems to be danger there for you. Nothing will stop me from going to the home of my family, said Sir Henry firmly. I want some time to think about everything. Will you and Dr. Watson join me for lunch at my hotel in two hours' time? Then I'll tell you my decision. Dr. Mortimer and Sir Henry said goodbye to us and decided to walk back to their hotel. As soon as our visitors had gone, Holmes jumped up from his chair. Quick, Watson! Put on your coat and hat. We must follow them. I did not ask any questions. Quickly we got ready and went into the street. Sir Henry and Dr. Mortimer were not far ahead of us, so we followed them easily. Suddenly Holmes stopped walking. On the other side of the road from our friends, I saw a taxi driving along very slowly. There's our man, Watson, Holmes said, pointing at the taxi. Come along. We'll have a good look at him. I saw a man with a large black beard looking out of the taxi's window. He had been following and watching our friends. But when he saw us coming towards him, he said something to the driver, and the taxi quickly drove down the road. Holmes looked around for another taxi, but he could not find one. He began to run after the first taxi, but it was soon out of sight. When he came back, he looked pleased. Well, Watson, I got the number of the taxi, said Holmes. Now I can find its driver. He may be able to tell us something about his passenger. If you saw that man again, would you know him? I don't know, but his beard was very strange, I said. Yes. That beard was easily noticed, don't you think? said Holmes. I am sure it was a false one. Chapter 6 More Mystery Later we went on to Sir Henry's hotel. 
he was happy to see us, but rather angry because another of his shoes had disappeared. This time, it was an old shoe instead of a new one. I could see that Holmes thought this was very interesting. He thought about it for a few moments, but he said nothing, except that perhaps there was a great shoe thief in London. At lunch, Sir Henry told Holmes that he had decided to go to Baskerville Hall. I think you are doing the right thing, Sir Henry, said Holmes. I know somebody is following you. If someone tries to harm you in London, it will be hard to stop him or catch him later. This is a very large city, but in the country we have a better chance. Then Holmes told them about the strange man in the taxi. He asked Dr. Mortimer if anyone with a large black beard lived in or near Baskerville Hall. Yes, said Dr. Mortimer. Barrymore, Sir Charles's butler, has a black beard. Well, then, we must find out whether Barrymore is in London or at Baskerville Hall, said Holmes. I shall send a message to Barrymore at the hall. It will say, Sir Henry has arrived in London. Is everything at Baskerville Hall ready for him? Then I will send another message to the local post office. This one will say, Please give this message to Mr. Barrymore. Return the message to Sir Henry Baskerville if Barrymore is away. I'll give the post office your address at this hotel. Before this evening we will know where Barrymore is. I know that Barrymore and his wife have a very fine home. But when the Baskervilles are not living in the hall, they have nothing to do, said Sir Henry. I see, said Holmes. Did Sir Charles leave anything to the Barrymores in his will, like money? And did they know about it? Yes, said Dr. Mortimer. They each received fifteen hundred pounds. Sir Charles told everyone what he had written in his will, so the Barrymores knew they would get the money. That's very interesting, said Holmes. I hope you don't suspect everyone who got something from Sir Charles' will, said Dr. Mortimer. I received eleven thousand pounds. Indeed, said Holmes. And who else received money? Many people got a little bit of money. He gave some money to some hospitals in the area. But the rest all went to Sir Henry, who received seven hundred and forty thousand pounds. I had no idea the Baskervilles were so wealthy, said Holmes in surprise. Well, their lands are worth more than one million pounds, Dr. Mortimer said. Holmes looked more interested than ever. There are many people, gentlemen, who would do anything for that much money, even commit murder. I have one more question. If something happened to Sir Henry, who would get Baskerville Hall and all its lands? Well, as you know, Sir Charles had two younger brothers. Sir Henry is the only son of the middle brother. The youngest brother of the three, Roger, was a criminal. The police wanted him, so he had to leave England. They say he looked exactly like old Sir Hugo, who first saw the hound. He was the same kind of man, too, drunken, cruel, and careless. He went to South America and died of a sickness there. If Sir Henry died, Baskerville Hall would go to James Desmond, who is a cousin of the Baskervilles. James Desmond is an old man who lives in the north of England. His life is very simple, and he would not want so much land. Thank you, Dr. Mortimer, said Holmes. Now, Sir Henry, I think that you should go to Baskerville Hall as quickly as possible. But you must not go alone. Unfortunately, I cannot leave London at this time because I am working on another case. I hope my friend Watson will go with you in my place. 
If there is any danger, you could not have a better man by your side. Both Sir Henry and I agreed to this idea. We decided to leave for Baskerville on the next Saturday. Just as we were leaving Sir Henry's room, he gave a cry and got down on his knees by the table. Well, here's my brown shoe that was lost, he said, reaching under the table. That's strange, said Dr. Mortimer. We looked around the room before lunch and the shoe wasn't there. None of the people in the hotel could explain how the shoe had got back into the room. On the way back to Baker Street in the taxi, Holmes sat thinking deeply. All through the afternoon and the evening he was very quiet. He went on thinking silently and smoking pipe after pipe. Just before dinner, a message arrived. It was from Sir Henry, and said, I have just heard that Barrymore is at the hall. So, Barrymore was not following Sir Henry today, said Holmes. Perhaps we will soon find out who the man really is. At that moment, the doorbell rang. It was the driver of the bearded man's taxi. I got a message that someone wanted to see me at this address, said the driver. Is there something wrong? No, no, my good man, said Holmes. In fact, if you can answer my questions clearly, I'll give you some money. I would like you to tell me about the man in your taxi this morning. He had a black beard, and he was watching this house at ten o'clock. Then he told you to follow the two gentlemen who came out of it. The taxi driver was surprised at how much Holmes knew. He answered, The man told me that he was a detective and that I should say nothing about him to anyone. Sir, this is a very serious business, said Holmes. I am also a detective, so do not be afraid to tell me everything you know. Well... The man told me his name, said the driver. Holmes looked like a cat that has just caught a mouse. That was very stupid of him, he said. What was it? His name, said the taxi driver, was Sherlock Holmes. For a moment, Holmes stared at the man in surprise. Then he burst out laughing. Excellent, my good man. Now, tell me when he got into the taxi what he looked like, and anything else you know. Some of what the man told us we already knew. However, we learned that after the taxi had disappeared, it had gone to the Waterloo station. The man had to catch a train there. The driver said that the man had on good clothes and had a long black beard. That long beard looks strange on such a young man, said the driver. The man looked about forty years old, and he was not very tall. The driver did not know the color of the man's eyes. Holmes gave the man some money and sent him away. Then he said, Well, Watson, we have a clever enemy. At this moment he is winning the game. We do not know who he really is or what he wants with Sir Henry. We have no answers to anything that has happened. I hope your time at Baskerville Hall will be more successful. However, you must be very careful whom you trust. There is too much danger in this case, and a lot of money. Chapter 7 Baskerville Hall The day that we left for Devonshire... Holmes came to the train station to tell us goodbye. Sir Henry and Dr. Mortimer told Holmes that no one had followed them since the first day. One of Sir Henry's shoes was still missing. Just before we left, Holmes told Sir Henry, Make sure you do not go out on the moor at night, and do not go anywhere alone. While they were talking, I checked to see that I had my gun with me. The journey to Devonshire was fast and very pleasant. We were met at Newtown Station and began our journey to Baskerville Hall. 
The countryside that we drove through was beautiful, full of trees and flowers. But close by we could see the dark, empty, strange hills of the moor. As we turned a corner, we saw a soldier on horseback who was carrying a gun. Dr. Mortimer asked our driver why the soldier was there and why he had a gun. A dangerous man has escaped from the prison, sir, he told us. His name is Selden, and he's the one who did that murder in London not long ago. He's been free for three days by now, and people are frightened, so we are trying to protect ourselves in case he attacks. I remembered the case well. It had been a terrible murder. I thought of this killer walking around on the empty wild moor close to the town. I felt more and more uncomfortable in this place. The beautiful green fields were behind us, and we were now on the cold open moor. Everything was gray and empty looking. There were large, sharp stones sticking up out of the hard ground, like the teeth of some huge animal. A cold wind was blowing, and night was falling. Sir Henry put his coat on. He looked as worried as I did. At last we reached the road that led to Baskerville Hall. It was a dark, long path, and the black shapes of old trees were on each side of it. Their branches stretched out over us like thin hands. At the end of this road we could see the great house standing. There were some lights on in the windows, but the house still looked frightening. I know why my Uncle Charles believed that he was in great danger here. This is not a house for normal men. It is not a welcoming place, said Sir Henry seriously. His voice shook a little as he spoke. Baskerville Hall was a huge building with a large main entrance. Most of the building was covered in dark green vines of ivy because the house was very old. A pale light shone through the large, thick windows. Welcome, Sir Henry. Welcome to Baskerville Hall, your home. Barrymore, the head servant, and his wife had come out of the house and were waiting for us. They took our possessions into the house. Then Dr. Mortimer told us goodbye, because he was going home. Sir Henry and I went into a large room with beautiful old furniture. A large fire was burning cheerfully. Outside, Baskerville Hall had seemed strange and frightening, but once we were inside, the house seemed more welcoming. Our old family home is just as I thought it would be, Sir Henry said. Barrymore took us to our rooms. The head servant had a black beard and was tall, thin and handsome. After we had washed and changed our clothes, we went to the dining room for dinner. The dining room was huge and needed more lights to make it more cheerful. On the walls were pictures of Sir Henry's ancestors, the Baskervilles of the past. All the ancestors had angry, stern looks on their faces. As we ate, they looked down on us and did nothing to help our hunger. After dinner, we decided to go to bed. In my bedroom, I looked out of my window. There was a strong wind on the moor, and I could see the clouds moving quickly across the sky in the light of the pale, cold moon. It was a long time before I was able to sleep. In the middle of the night, I woke up and heard the sound of a woman crying. The sound was not far away, and was certainly in the house. Chapter 8 The Stapletons of Penhouse The next morning was sunny, and we were all much more cheerful. The house did not seem so bad in the light of day. I told Sir Henry about the crying of the woman. He called for Barrymore and asked him if he knew anything about the crying. When he heard Sir Henry's question... Barrymore's face turned pale. Well, Sir Henry, there are only two women in this house, he answered slowly. One is the maid, 
who sleeps on the other side of the house. The other is my wife, and I can tell you that she was certainly not crying. But I knew that Barrymore was lying. I had seen Mrs. Barrymore that morning when she did not see me. I could see clearly that she had been crying for many hours. Her eyes were very red, and she looked terribly tired and in pain. Why would Barrymore lie to us? Why was his wife crying? It seemed to me that Barrymore was more mysterious than we had thought. Was it possible that Barrymore was, in fact, the man who had been watching Sir Henry in London? I decided I would watch him closely in the future. That morning, I decided to go to the local post office and see if Holmes' message had really been given to Barrymore or to someone else. Sir Henry had to read over some papers, so I walked to the post office alone. It was in the nearest village, which was called Grimpen. This was the town that Dr. Mortimer lived in. I spoke to the boy who had taken the message to the hall. Did you give it to Mr. Barrymore himself? I asked. Well, the boy said, he was working in one of the gardens, so I couldn't give it to him. But I gave it to Mrs. Barrymore, and she said she would give it to him immediately. Did you see Mr. Barrymore? I asked him. No, said the boy, looking impatient. It was hopeless to ask any more questions. Although Holmes' ideas in London had been clever, I still did not have the answers I needed. I was walking away from the post office when I heard someone calling me. When I turned around, I expected to see Dr. Mortimer, because I did not know anyone else in the area, but it was a stranger. He was a small, thin man with blond hair and no beard. He was carrying a net to catch butterflies and a box to put them in. Good afternoon, Dr. Watson, he said as he came up to me. My name is Stapleton. I was visiting my friend Dr. Mortimer when I saw you walk by. Dr. Mortimer told me who you are. May I walk along with you? This path back to the hall goes near my home, which is called Penn House. Please come in and meet my sister and spend an hour with us. I decided to do this. So we walked along together. I know that you are a close friend of Sherlock Holmes, said Stapleton. Has Mr. Holmes any ideas about Sir Charles' death? I can't answer that question, I said. Will Mr. Holmes visit us himself? he asked. He is in London on business and cannot leave, I answered, a little coldly. I did not like him asking me these questions. We continued to walk. Stapleton told me that he and his sister had lived in Devonshire for only two years. They had moved there soon after Sir Charles had begun to live in Baskerville Hall. He also talked about the moor and how interesting it was to him. He told me to look across the moor to a place that was a dull green and brown color. That is the great Grimpen Marsh, Stapleton said. If animals or men go into the marsh, they will fall into it and die. But I am not afraid of it, because I know where to walk. Oh, look what is happening to another of those poor horses. As we watched, we saw a horse that was fighting to get out of the thick, wet sand of the marsh. We heard the horse's scream as its head and neck disappeared under the sand. It's gone, Stapleton said. The marsh has caught and killed it. That often happens. It is a very evil place, the great Grimpen Marsh. I noticed that as Stapleton spoke, he looked almost happy. But you say you know how to travel in and out of the marsh safely, I asked him. Yes, there are a few paths, and I have found them. Those low hills you can see are like islands, which are surrounded by the wet marsh sand. 
That is where I can find the unusual plants and butterflies that I collect. I think I shall try my luck one day, I said, just to see what he would say. He looked at me in surprise. Please don't try, he said. You would never return alive, and it would be my fault. Suddenly a long, low howl, very deep and rather sad, came over the moor. It filled the whole air, then it faded away. What was that? I asked. I felt a touch of fear in my heart. Stapleton had a strange look on his face. The people say it's the ghostly hound of the Baskervilles, which is looking for something to hunt and kill. I've heard it once or twice before, but never so loud. People usually hear it only at night. You are a man of science, I said. You don't believe that story, do you? Isn't there an ordinary explanation for the sound? Well, perhaps there is. There are some very strange birds that live in the marsh. Their voices sound like something howling or crying. Maybe the cry we heard was one of those. At that moment a small butterfly flew across the path in front of us. Excuse me, Dr. Watson, cried Stapleton, and ran off to try to catch the butterfly. He ran quickly and followed the butterfly into the marsh. As I watched him, I saw that he knew exactly where to put his feet, so he was not in any danger of drowning. Then I heard the sound of steps behind me. I turned and saw a woman walking towards me. I was sure she was Miss Stapleton. She was very beautiful and tall, with a lovely face. Before I could say anything, she said, Go back. Go straight back to London, immediately. I cannot tell you why, but please do what I ask you. Never come near Baskerville Hall again. But my brother is coming. Say nothing to him. Stapleton had caught the butterfly and was walking back to us. Hello, my dear, he said to his sister, but it seemed to me that his voice was not very friendly. I see that you two have met one another. Yes. She said, I was telling Sir Henry that it is late in the year to see how beautiful the moor can be. I am sorry, I said. You have made a mistake. I am not Sir Henry. I am Dr. Watson, a friend who is visiting him. Miss Stapleton was clearly angry with herself. I'm sorry, she said. Please forget what I said. But do come and have tea at our house. The house was lonely and dark. I wondered why the Stapletons had come to live so far away from other people near the cold, dark moor. Stapleton seemed to know what I was thinking. He said, You might think this is a lonely place to live, but the moors can be very beautiful, and my sister and I are happy here. I once owned a school in the north of England, but I had to close it. I miss teaching the children, but there is plenty to do here, and we have good neighbors. I hope Sir Henry will become a friend. His uncle was very much loved in this town. Do you think I might visit the hall this afternoon to meet him? I am sure he would like to meet you, I said. I must return to Baskerville Hall now. But I will tell him you are coming. I said good bye to the Stapletons and began to walk back to the hall. I had been walking for only a few minutes, but suddenly I saw Miss Stapleton standing on the road in front of me. She was breathing quickly, and I realized she had run by a quicker way to get ahead of me. Dr. Watson, she said, I am sorry for the mistake I made. I thought you were Sir Henry. Please, please forget what I said. You are not in danger. Now I must go. My brother will be wondering where I am. Miss Stapleton, your message is very important to me, I said. 
If Sir Henry is in danger, I must tell him. Do you know the story of the hound? She asked me in a quiet voice. Yes, but I do not believe it. It is only a silly ghost story, I replied. It is all true, all of it, she said. She looked at me and her eyes burned with emotion. You must persuade Sir Henry to leave this place. So many of his family have died here. If he stays here, I am sure he will die. Sir Henry won't leave this place without a real reason. He will not leave because of a ghost story, my dear, I said gently. Miss Stapleton sighed and said nothing. One more question, Miss Stapleton, I said. The story of the hound is well known. Why didn't you want your brother to hear what you said? Miss Stapleton looked uncomfortable. My brother wants the head of the Baskerville family to live in the hall, she said. He thinks Sir Henry should continue to help the village people, like Sir Charles did before him. He doesn't want Sir Henry to go back to America or somewhere else. He doesn't want me to talk about the hound. Because he thinks it might scare Sir Henry away. I must go now, or my brother will know I have been talking to you. Goodbye. She turned and went back towards her house, and I walked on to Baskerville Hall. Chapter 9 The Escaped Prisoner That same afternoon, Mr. Stapleton came to Baskerville Hall to meet Sir Henry. Sir Henry seemed to like Stapleton. So the next morning we all visited the place where the evil Sir Hugo had died. Then we walked to Penhouse and had lunch. It was clear to both Stapleton and I that Sir Henry liked Miss Stapleton very much. His eyes followed her everywhere. And I know he must have thought she was beautiful. Even though Miss Stapleton was very quiet, I was sure she liked Sir Henry as well. When we walked back to Baskerville Hall, he could not stop talking about her. We saw the Stapletons almost every day after that. Soon we could see that Sir Henry had fallen deeply in love with Miss Stapleton. At first, I thought that Stapleton would be very pleased if his sister married Sir Henry. But for some reason, I saw that he did not want this to happen. He did everything he could to make sure that they were never alone. One or two times they did manage to meet alone, but Stapleton followed them. He was never pleased to see them together. I soon met another friend of Sir Henry's. His name was Mr. Franklin, and he lived about four miles to the south of the hall. He was an old man with a red face and white hair that stood up from his head. He had two favorite things to do. The first was arguing. He argued with everybody and loved to disagree with people. The second thing he liked to do was study the stars. For this, he had a very big telescope. But for several days, instead of watching the stars, he watched the moor through his telescope instead. He wanted to find Selden, the escaped murderer. No one had seen this man, Selden, for many days. We all decided he must have left the moor and gone somewhere else. A few nights later, at about two o'clock in the morning, I was woken by a noise. It was the sound of someone walking softly outside my door. I got up, opened the door, and looked out. It was Barrymore walking down the hall. I had a feeling that something strange was going on, so I followed him as quietly as I could. He went into one of the empty bedrooms and left the door open. I went quietly up to the door and looked inside. Barrymore stood at the window. He held a candle in his hand and stared out at the moor. He stood without moving for a few minutes, and then he put out the light. Quickly, 
I went back to my room. A few minutes later, Barrymore walked quietly by my door once again. The next morning I told Sir Henry what I had seen. We must find out what he is doing, said Sir Henry. If we move quietly, he won't hear us. That night we sat in Sir Henry's room and waited. At about three o'clock in the morning, we heard the sound of footsteps outside the bedroom. We looked out and saw Barrymore. We followed him as quietly as we could. He went into the same room as before. We reached the door and looked into the room. There was Barrymore, with the candle in his hand. He was looking out the window across the moor, exactly as I had seen him on the night before. Sir Henry walked into the room and said in a loud voice, Why, Barrymore, what are you doing here in the middle of the night? Barrymore turned around quickly. There was fear in his face. Nothing, sir, he said slowly. It, it was the window, sir. I go round at night to see that they are closed, and this one was open. He seemed terribly nervous. Come now, Barrymore, said Sir Henry. Do not lie to us. What were you doing with that light? You were holding it up to the window, as if you were looking for something outside. I suddenly had an idea. Sir Henry, I think he was sending a message with the light, I said. Let's see if there's an answer from someone outside. I held the light up to the window and looked out into the darkness. Suddenly, I saw another light shining on the moor. There it is, I said. I waved my light backwards and forwards across the window. The light on the moor answered me by moving in the same way. Now, Barrymore, who is your friend on the moor? What's going on? said Sir Henry. That's my business, said Barrymore. I won't tell you. Are you making some criminal plan against me? Sir Henry asked angrily. No, Sir Henry, this is not against you, said a voice behind us. It was Mrs. Barrymore. She was standing at the door. He is doing it for me. My unhappy brother is cold and hungry on the moor, and I wanted to help him. Our light is to tell him that food is ready for him. His light shows us where we should take the food. Then your brother is, began Sir Henry. The escaped prisoner, sir, Selden, the murderer. He is my younger brother. He has done evil things, but to me he is still like a little child. When I read that he had escaped, I knew he would come to Baskerville Hall to find me. I had to help him. Everything my husband has done has been for me. Please don't take his job from him. It's not his fault. Sir Henry turned to Barrymore and said, Well, Barrymore, I cannot blame you for helping your wife. We will talk about this in the morning. The Barrymores left us. That murderer is waiting out there by that light, said Sir Henry. He's a danger to everyone in this area. I'm going to catch him. If you want to come with me, Watson, get your gun and let's go. We got our guns and left the hall immediately. We must surprise him and catch him, said Sir Henry. Now, Watson, this night reminds me of something. Do you remember what the old papers said? They said, the devil does his work when the world is dark. Just as he spoke, we heard a loud, long, strange howl coming from across the moor. It was the same cry I had heard when I was with Stapleton on the edge of the great Grimpen Marsh. What is that noise? asked Sir Henry. He stopped and put his hand on my arm to hold me back. I've heard it before, I said. Stapleton says it's the cry of a bird. Watson, said Sir Henry, his voice shaking. Clearly, that is the howl of a hound, and a horrible one. 
like no other dog on this earth. What do the local people think that cry is? They say it is the cry of the hound of the Baskervilles, I replied slowly. Sir Henry said nothing for a few moments. Can there possibly be some truth in this story? said Sir Henry. Am I really in danger from some large evil animal? I think I am as brave as most men, but that sound froze my heart. It is so frightening. But we have come out to catch that prisoner Selden, and the devil himself will not make me turn back. Clearly, there is enough danger on the moor already. It was difficult to cross the moor in the dark, but at last we reached the light. It was standing on a rock. Suddenly, a man's face looked at us from behind the rock. When he saw us, he screamed as he turned to run. Sir Henry and I were both fast runners and very healthy men, but we soon realized that we could not catch Selden. He knew the way, and he was running for his life, which made him even faster than we were. Soon we had lost him in the dark, so we stopped and sat down to rest. At that moment a very strange thing happened. On our right the moon was low in the sky. In its light we could see the top of a hill. On that hill stood a tall, thin man with the moon behind him. He was standing very still, and he was watching us. I knew this man was not Selden, because he was much taller. I turned to Sir Henry to ask him who the man was, but as I turned, the man disappeared. I wanted to go and try to find him, but we were tired and it was now very late at night. I remembered that Sir Henry might be in danger, so we went back to Baskerville Hall. Who was the tall man I had seen? Was the man who had been watching us a friend or another enemy? I wished more and more that Holmes could leave London and come to Baskerville Hall. I wrote a letter to him every few days and told him everything that happened in the case. Chapter 10 The Letter The following day was dark, and there was a thick mist in the air. The hall was surrounded by heavy low clouds. The weather made us all feel very unhappy. It was difficult to be cheerful when everything seemed so dangerous. I thought of Sir Charles's death and the awful sound of the hound. I had now heard the thing twice, whatever it was. Holmes did not believe that there was a supernatural hound. At first, I had not believed it either, but I had heard a hound two times by now. Was there a huge hound living on the moor? If so, where did it get its food? Why was it never seen by day? It all seemed terribly strange to me. That morning Sir Henry and Barrymore argued about Selden, the escaped prisoner. Barrymore begged Sir Henry not to try and catch Selden. Barrymore, the man is dangerous, said Sir Henry. He'll do anything. With him here we are all in danger. Nobody is safe until he is in prison again. We must tell the police. Sir, I promise you he won't enter into any houses, said Barrymore, and he won't cause any trouble. He has told us that in a few days he will catch a boat for South America. Please, don't tell the police about him. If you do, my wife and I will be in serious trouble, and we only wanted to help him. What do you think, Watson? Sir Henry asked me. I don't think he will break into houses or cause trouble. If he did, then the police would know where to find him. He's probably not a stupid man. I hope you're right, said Sir Henry. I'm sure we're breaking the law by not telling the police about him. But I don't want to get Barrymore and his wife into trouble, 
so I shall leave Selden alone for now. But at the first sign of trouble, I will tell the police about him. Barrymore could not find the words to thank Sir Henry enough. Then he said, Sir Henry, you have been so kind to us that I want to do something for you in return. I have never told anyone else about this. I know something more about poor Sir Charles's death. Sir Henry and I jumped up at once and stared at him. What do you know? I asked. I know why he was waiting at the moor gate on the night he died. He was going to meet a woman. Sir Charles was meeting a woman? Who was the woman? I don't know her name, Barrymore said, but I know the initials of her name. They are L.L. How do you know all this, Barrymore? I asked. Well, on the day of his death, Sir Charles got a letter. It was from Newtown, and the address on it was written in a woman's handwriting. I was busy that day and forgot all about it. However, some time after Sir Charles died, my wife was cleaning the fireplace in his room. In the fireplace she found a letter. Most of it was burned, but the bottom of one page was not burned. On it was written, Please, please burn this letter, and be at the gate by ten o'clock, L.L. We don't know who L.L. is, but if you could find out, you might learn more about Sir Charles's death. We haven't told anyone else about this. It would not be good if the town thought strange things about poor, kind Sir Charles. But we thought we should tell you, Sir Henry. When the Barrymores had left us, Sir Henry turned to me. If we can find L.L., we may be able to solve the mystery, he said. What should we do, Watson? I must write to Holmes at once, I said. I went to my room and wrote a letter to Holmes, telling him all the details of Barrymore's story. The next day it rained heavily. I put on my coat and went out for a walk on the wild, cold moor. As I walked, I thought of Selden wandering around the moor in this weather. Who knew what he was doing now? I also thought of that other man, the mysterious person who had been watching us. Suddenly, I saw Dr. Mortimer's carriage drive by. I waved to him and he stopped. He seemed happy to see me and said he would take me back to the hall. While we were traveling, I said, Dr. Mortimer, you must know everyone that lives in this area. Do you know a woman whose first and last names begin with the letters L.L.? Dr. Mortimer thought for a minute and then said, Yes, I do. There's a Mrs. Laura Lyons. She lives in Newtown. Who is she? I asked. She's Mr. Franklin's daughter. What? Angry old Mr. Franklin who likes to watch the stars? Yes, said Dr. Mortimer. You see, Laura married a man named Lyons who came here to paint pictures of the moor. But he was cruel to her, and after a while he left her. Her father will not speak to her because she married a man he did not like. So now both her husband and her father have left her alone. She is very unhappy. How does she live? Does she have any money? I asked. Well, there are some people who know her sad story and who have helped her. Mr. Stapleton and Sir Charles have given her some money. I gave her a little also. She used the money to start a typewriting business. Dr. Mortimer wanted to know why I was asking about Mrs. Lyons. I told him I wanted to keep the reason a secret. So we talked about other things for the rest of the journey back to Baskerville Hall. Another interesting thing happened that day. That evening, after dinner, I decided to speak with Barrymore alone. I asked him whether Mrs. Barrymore's brother, Selden, had left for South America yet. 
I don't know, sir, Barrymore said. I hope he has gone for his own good. My wife and I have not heard from him since we last left him some food and clothes. That was three days ago. Did you see or speak to him when you left him the food and clothes? No, sir. But when I went to that place yesterday, the food and clothes were gone, Barrymore told me. Then probably Selden had been there, I said. I think so, sir. Well, unless that other man took everything. I looked hard at Barrymore. You know there is another man, then. Have you seen him? No, sir. But Selden told me about him a week or more ago. He is hiding from someone, too, but he is not a criminal. I don't like it, sir. I feel that something terrible is going to happen. Sir Henry would be much safer in London, I think. Did Selden tell you anything else about this other man? I asked. Well, Selden said he looked like a gentleman. But he was living in one of those little old stone houses on the moor. A boy works for him and brings him all the food and things he needs. That's all Selden told me. Sir, why would a gentleman live on the moor like an animal? It is very strange to me. I agreed with Barrymore, but I did not say so. Instead, I thanked him and he left me. I went to the window and looked out at the rain and the clouds. It was a wild night, with the rain pouring and the wind blowing hard. I knew the little stone houses Barrymore had spoken about. There were many of them on the moor. Many hundreds of years ago, the people who lived on the moor had built them to live in. They would not keep a man warm and dry in bad weather. I guessed that because of the trouble he was in. Selden could not choose to live anywhere else. If he lived in the town, of course he would be caught. But why did this other gentleman want to live in such a strange place? I sat and thought about what I should do next. I decided I must try to find the man who had been watching us. I felt sure he knew something very important about the case. Was he the enemy who had been following us since the very beginning in London? If he was, and I could make him talk to me, perhaps our difficulties would be at an end. I decided to hunt for the man on my own. I did not want to lead Sir Henry out onto the moor, where he might be in danger. Chapter 11 Laura Lyons I told Sir Henry what I had learned about Laura Lyons. I wanted to speak with her as soon as possible, so I went to her house in Newtown. A maid took me into the sitting room. There, a very pretty lady with dark hair was working at a typewriter. I told her who I was and that I had met her father. Mrs. Lyons looked sad. I do not speak to my father, she said. He gave me no help when I was in trouble. Instead, Sir Charles Baskerville and some other kind people helped me when I was poor and hungry. As a matter of fact, I have come to talk to you about Sir Charles, I said. I want to know if you ever wrote a letter to him asking him to meet you anywhere. Mrs. Lyons looked angry and her face turned red. Dr. Watson, she said. I do not know why you are asking me about my private life, because it is none of your business. But if you must know, the answer is no. I never wrote this kind of letter to him. Of course, I knew she was lying. Mrs. Lyons, I think you do not remember clearly, I said. I know that you wrote a letter to him on the day of his death. The end of your letter said, Please, please burn this letter and be at the gate by ten o'clock. For a moment, Mrs. Lyons said nothing and looked away from me out the window. Then she sighed and said in a low voice, I ask Sir Charles to tell nobody. 
Do not think that Sir Charles told anyone about you, I said. He put the letter on the fire, but not all of it was burnt. The end of the message was found by me. Now, did you write that letter to him? Yes, she said. Why should I be sorry for writing to him? Sir Charles had been very kind to me, and I asked him to help me one more time. I learned that he was going to London early on the following day, so I asked him to meet me before he went. I could not go to the hall earlier that day. But why did you ask him to meet you in the alley of trees instead of in the house? I asked. What would people think if I went to the house of an unmarried man at that time of night? She asked. What happened when you got there? I asked. I didn't go, she replied. Mrs. Lyons, I don't believe you, I said. I am telling you the truth. Something happened that stopped me from going. I won't tell you what it was, she said angrily. Mrs. Lyons, I said, if you did not see Sir Charles, you must tell me why. If you do not, I will have to go to the police with this new piece of information about the letter. Then the police will come to you, and you may be in trouble. Mrs. Lyons seemed to think for a moment. Then she said, I see that I must tell you. Perhaps you know that I married a terrible man who was very cruel to me. He hit me and called me names. I hate him, and I wanted to get a divorce. But a divorce is expensive, and I had no money. I thought that if Sir Charles heard my story, he would help me to get a divorce. Then why didn't you go to see Sir Charles? I asked her. Because someone else helped me, she said. Why didn't you write to Sir Charles and tell him? I was going to, but I saw in the newspaper the next morning that he had died. I asked Mrs. Lyons many other questions, but no matter what I asked her, she did not change her story. I decided that she was telling me the truth, but I wanted to make sure. I decided to examine two important parts of her story. If they were right, then I had no doubt that she was telling me the truth. First, I could find out if Mrs. Lyons had begun to get a divorce at the time of Sir Charles's death. Second, I could find out if she had really not gone to Baskerville Hall on the night of Sir Charles's death. I had discovered all I could for the moment. I told Mrs. Lyons good bye and went to search for more information. It was time to find the man on the moor. Chapter 12 The Man on the Moor I drove out of Newtown and went to begin my search for this man. There were hundreds of the old stone huts on the moor. Barrymore did not know in which little house the mysterious man was living. On the night when Sir Henry and I had chased Selden, I had seen the man on the top of a hill, so I decided to start my search near that place. The path I took ran past Mr. Franklin's house and I saw him standing outside his house. He called to me and asked me to come in and have a drink with him. He had been arguing with the police and was angry with them. He began to tell me about it. Well, those police will be sorry, he said. I could tell them where to look for that Selden, but I won't, not one word. You see, I have been looking at these moors with my telescope for a long time. I have not seen the prisoner yet, but I have seen the person who takes him food. If Mr. Franklin had seen Barrymore and his wife, then we were in trouble. But Mr. Franklin's next words showed me that I did not need to worry. You, sir, will be surprised to hear that a young boy takes food to the prisoner. At the same time each day, the boy walks by here, and he is always carrying a bag. I am sure that he is going to see the prisoner. Come and look through my telescope, and you will see that I am right. It is almost time for him to walk by. 
we went up on to the roof and looked through the telescope. Mr. Franklin was right. There was someone moving on a hill in front of the house. It was a boy with a bag over his shoulder. Many times the boy looked around to see that no one was following him, and then he disappeared over the hill. Now, Dr. Watson, remember that I don't want the police to know these things, Franklin said to me. I'm too angry with them at the moment to help them. I decided that Mr. Franklin was a silly man, but I agreed not to tell the police and said goodbye. While Franklin was watching me leave, I walked along the road, but as soon as I was around the corner, I went towards the hill where the boy had gone. The sun was already going down when I reached the top of the hill. The boy had disappeared, and there was nothing else in that lonely place. Below me, on the other side of the hill, was a circle of old stone huts. In the middle of the circle was one hut that had a better roof than the others. Perhaps this was the place where the mysterious man was hiding. I would soon find out. As I walked towards the hut, I saw that someone had certainly been using it. A path had been worn up to the door. I took my gun out of my pocket and made sure that it was ready to shoot. Quickly and quietly, I walked up to the hut and looked inside. There was no one there, but I was sure that this was where the man lived. As I looked around the hut, I decided that the mysterious man must be a brave person. His bed was a flat stone with some blankets. There had been a fire in one corner. There was a large bowl that was filled with water and some cooking pots. The man's table was a large flat stone. On the table was the bag the boy had been carrying. Under the bag I saw a piece of paper with writing on it. Quickly I picked up the paper and read what was written on it. It said, Dr. Watson has gone to Newtown. So the mysterious man had told someone to watch me, and this was a message from his spy. Was this man a dangerous enemy? Or did he want to help us? It seemed to me that he was an enemy, but I decided I would not leave the hut until I knew. Outside, the sun was low in the sky. In the golden evening light, the moor looked calm and peaceful. I felt frightened as I waited for the mysterious man. Suddenly, I heard footsteps coming towards the hut. As they came closer, I moved into the darkest corner of the hut. I did not want the man to see me until I had seen him first. The footsteps stopped, and I could hear nothing at all. Then a shadow fell across the door of the hut. My dear Watson, the man said, it is a lovely evening out here. I think you would enjoy it more outside, don't you? Chapter 13 Too Late for a moment or two I could not move. I knew that voice. Holmes, I cried, Holmes! I ran outside, and there was Holmes. He was sitting on a stone, and his gray eyes were dancing with amusement. He looked a little thin, but bright and wide awake. His skin was brown from the wind and the sun, but his clothes were clean and neat. He certainly did not look like a man who had been living in the middle of a wild, cold moor. I have never been so glad to see anyone in my whole life, I said. I am glad too, and also surprised, Holmes said, as he shook me warmly by the hand. How did you find me? I told him everything Franklin had told me, and how I had seen the boy and followed him. Holmes went into the hut and looked at the food and at the note with it. I guess that you have been to see Mrs. Laura Lyons, he said, and when I told him that he was right, he went on. When we put together everything that we know, I think we will know almost everything about the mystery. Then we will be able to solve it. But how did you get here, I asked him, and what have you been doing? I thought you had to finish your case in London. That is what I wanted you to think, he said. Holmes 
"'Surely you trust me more than that,' I said. I was a little upset because he had not told me his plans. "'I am sorry if it seems I have tricked you, my dear Watson. But I did not want our enemy to know I was here. But I also wanted to watch you and Sir Henry to make sure that you were safe. If you knew that I was here, our enemy would also find out. You are a kind person, too kind to leave me alone out here in bad weather. Our enemy would follow you if he saw you coming out here with food or important news. Do not worry, you have done excellent work. The letters you wrote to me, with all their valuable details, have been brought here. Without you, I would not have been able to discover so much. Holmes' warm words of thanks made me feel much better, and I decided that he was right not to have told me his plans. Now, tell me about your visit to Mrs. Laura Lyons, Holmes said. I told Holmes everything Mrs. Lyons had said and how she had acted. This is all very important, Holmes said. Your information gives me the answers to questions that I did not know before. Did you know that Mrs. Lyons and Stapleton are very close friends? They often meet, and they write to each other. Perhaps I can use this information to turn Stapleton's wife against him. His wife, I asked. Who and where is she? The lady called Miss Stapleton who pretends to be his sister, is really his wife, said Holmes. I was shocked. Good heavens, Holmes! Are you sure? If she is his wife, why did Stapleton allow Sir Henry to fall in love with her? Well, Watson, Stapleton did not know that Sir Henry was going to feel that way. By falling in love with Miss Stapleton, Sir Henry has hurt no one except himself. By following them everywhere, Stapleton made sure that Sir Henry never had a chance to tell her he loved her. I tell you again, the lady is his wife and not his sister. Stapleton owned a school in the north of England before they came here two years ago. He told you that, and then you told me in your letter. I checked to see if these things were true. I found out that there was a school... The man who had owned it went away with his wife when the school closed. They changed their name, but someone told me what they looked like. These people were definitely the Stapletons. But why do they pretend to be brother and sister, I asked. This is not Miss Stapleton's fault. Stapleton knows she will be much more useful to him if people think she is a free unmarried woman. Suddenly I realized that Stapleton's smiling face hid an evil, strange character. So Stapleton is our enemy. He is the man with the long black beard, who followed us in London. And the warning note to Sir Henry came from Miss Stapleton. That's right, said Holmes. But if Miss Stapleton is really his wife, why does he write to Laura Lyons? Your excellent work has given me the answer to that question, Watson. You told me that Mrs. Lyons deeply wanted to get a divorce. I realized that she hoped to marry Stapleton. He told her that he was not married, and that he loved her and wanted to marry her. Terrible man, isn't he? When she learns the truth, she may decide to help us. We must go and talk to her tomorrow. One last question, Holmes, I said. What does Stapleton want? What is he trying to do here? Holmes spoke very quietly as he answered my question. Murder. Cold-blooded murder. Stapleton is trying to kill Sir Henry. Do not ask me to tell you more, Watson. I am about to catch him in a trap. There is only one danger, that he will act before I am ready. Another day, or perhaps two, and I shall have solved the mystery. Until then, you must watch Sir Henry very, very closely. 
You should be with him every day. But I am glad you came here. You have found out many important things. Suddenly we heard an awful scream that spread across the moor. It was a cry of pain. Oh, my God, I whispered. What is that? Holmes had jumped to his feet. Where is it, Watson? he said. The hopeless cry came again, louder, nearer, and more terrible than before. And then we heard a new sound, the howl of a hound, long, deep, and frightening. The hound, cried Holmes. Come, Watson, come. Good God, we might be too late. Chapter 14 Death on the Moor Holmes started running, and I followed him. From somewhere in front of us came one more hopeless scream. Then we heard something falling. We stopped and listened. I saw Holmes put his hand to his head and sigh. Our enemy has won, Watson. We're too late. I was a fool not to act sooner. Watson, why did you leave the man I asked you to protect? But if something has happened, at least I shall see that Stapleton is caught. We ran towards the place where we heard the screams. In a moment, we reached a sharp, steep edge. Below us, lying on the ground, we saw the body of a man. He had fallen on his head, which was bent under him, and his neck was broken. Holmes lit a match. We were horrified to see the blood running out onto the ground from his head. We looked at the clothes the man was wearing. He wore a thick, red-brown country suit. These were the clothes Sir Henry always wore. We stared at the man for another moment, and then the match went out. Our hearts turned sick and cold inside us. The devil! The murderer! I shall never forgive myself for leaving Sir Henry alone, I cried angrily. It is more my fault than yours, said Holmes. I have let this good man die because I was busy trying to catch Stapleton. I did not watch him closely enough. It is the greatest mistake I have ever made. Oh, why did Sir Henry come out onto the moor? I told him it would lead to his death. Now both Sir Henry and his uncle have been murdered. By heavens, I am going to catch Stapleton before another day is gone. With heavy hearts we climbed down the rocks and stood on either side of the broken body. Holmes bent over the body and began to move it. Suddenly he cried out in surprise. Look at the face, he shouted, hitting me on the back. Sir Henry is safe, Watson. This is Selden, the escaped prisoner. We turned the body over. It was definitely Selden. On the night Sir Henry and I had chased Selden over the moor, I had seen his face. Then, suddenly, I understood what had happened. Sir Henry had given some old clothes to Barrymore. Barrymore had wanted to give Selden these clothes. This suit must have been one of the pieces of clothing. Then these clothes have caused the death of the poor man. You see, Watson, I have put everything I know together. The mysterious hound and Stapleton's evil plan to murder Sir Henry. I have discovered that Stapleton controls the hound. It belongs to him. I was so amazed that I could not say anything. Holmes continued to speak. The hound had been given something of Sir Henry's to smell. This way, whenever it smelled Sir Henry, it would follow him. I think that is why the shoe was taken from the hotel in London. So the hound followed the scent and hunted this man. But there is one thing I don't know yet. How did Selden know that the hound was following him? We know he ran a long way. He was screaming for a long time before he fell, and we could hear that he was running as he screamed. So, 
At first the hound must have been some distance away from him. How could he see it in the dark? Its fur is black. How did he know it was there until it was close behind him? I cannot answer that, I said. But there is something else I don't understand. Why was the hound out on the moor tonight? Stapleton would not let the hound go outside unless he thought Sir Henry was there. We may find out the answer to that question very soon, said Holmes. Here comes Stapleton. His sharp eyes had seen a figure moving in the darkness in front of us. As the man came closer, I could see that it was indeed Stapleton. We must be very careful to act normally and not to show that we suspect him, Holmes whispered to me. Stapleton stopped when he saw us and then walked forward again. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Is that you? I didn't expect to see you on the moor at this time of night. But, dear me, what's this? Is somebody hurt? Not, don't tell me that it's our dear friend Sir Henry. He went past me and bent over the dead man. I heard him breathe in quickly. Who, who is this? he cried. He seemed extremely upset. It's Selden, the escaped prisoner. For a moment, we saw a look of anger and disappointment on Stapleton's face. Then he quickly hid it. He looked sharply from Holmes to me. Dear me, how terrible! How did he die? We think he broke his neck by falling over the edge of these rocks, I said. I heard someone screaming, and that is why I ran out. I was worried about dear Sir Henry, Stapleton said. Why were you worried about Sir Henry, I asked. Because I had invited him to tea at my house. When he did not come, I was surprised. Then, when I heard cries on the moor, I thought something had happened. I wonder, his eyes went quickly from my face to Holmes, did you hear anything else at all? No, said Holmes. His voice was very calm. Did you? No, said Stapleton. What do you mean, then? Oh, you know the stories about the supernatural hound. Perhaps it was here tonight. We heard no sounds of a hound, I said. How do you think this poor man fell to his death? Stapleton asked. Well, I think Selden was very cold and hungry. He was also afraid that the police would catch him. These things must have made him crazy. He ran around the moor in his craziness and fell over this edge. It was an accident, I said. Stapleton looked hard at Holmes. Do you agree, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? he said. You're quick to guess who I am, said Holmes. We've all been expecting you to come here ever since Watson arrived. I see, said Holmes. I am sure Dr. Watson is right about the way Selden died. It's a sad death, but I must return to London tomorrow. Oh, you are leaving, cried Stapleton. He looked almost happy. Can you explain the terrible things that have happened here before you go? I do not think so, sir. This has not been a good case for me. I am not always as successful as I would like to be. I need facts, not more ghost stories. Stapleton looked hard at him, trying to see if he was lying. But Holmes had spoken very seriously, and his words sounded true. I saw that Stapleton believed him. We covered Selden's body with a cloth. Then Holmes and I walked back to Baskerville Hall while Stapleton went home. Watson, Stapleton is a clever man, and an enemy who will be difficult to trap, said Holmes. He was very good at hiding his anger when he saw that his hound had killed the wrong man. But I'm sorry that he has seen you, Holmes, I said. So am I, 
but we cannot do anything about that now. Now that Stapleton knows I am here, he may be more careful, or he may act more quickly and try to hurt Sir Henry again. Why can't we give him to the police at once? Because right now we can't prove anything against him, of course. Sir Charles was found dead because his heart stopped. We cannot prove that Stapleton sent his hound to frighten Sir Charles to death. Also, we cannot prove that Stapleton's hound was on the moor tonight. Selden died from a fall. So right now we have no evidence. We shall see Mrs. Lyons tomorrow, and she may give us more information about Stapleton. But whatever happens, I have a good plan. There will be some danger, but by the end of tomorrow, I hope we will have solved the mystery and caught Stapleton with his hound. He would not tell me anything else. Are you staying at Baskerville Hall tonight? I asked. Yes, he replied. I do not have to hide any longer from anyone. But one last word, Watson. Do not tell Sir Henry that the hound killed Selden. Let him think that Selden died from a fall. If he knows that the hound is on the moor, he will become even more frightened. Tomorrow may be dangerous for him, and he must have courage. In your last letter you told me that the Stapletons asked Sir Henry to come to dinner tomorrow night. Is this true? Yes. And they have invited me, too, I told him. Well, you must tell them you cannot come. Sir Henry must go alone. If my plan is going to work, tomorrow you can write them a letter. And now I think we are both ready for some food. Chapter 15 The Trap Sir Henry was very pleased to see Holmes when we arrived at Baskerville Hall. However, he was surprised to see that Holmes had no clothes with him. It was hard for me to tell Barrymore and his wife about Selden's death. Mrs. Barrymore cried, and both of them were very sad. While we had dinner, Sir Henry told us that he had enjoyed a quiet day at the house alone. He remembered that Holmes had told him to keep away from the moor, and so he had not gone to the Stapleton's house that night. We did not tell him how happy we were that he had stayed away from the moor. All through dinner, Holmes had been very quiet. He was looking carefully at the pictures of Sir Henry's ancestors on the wall. Suddenly, he pointed to one picture. Sir Henry? "'Which Baskerville man is that?' he asked. Sir Henry and I both looked at the picture. "'That is Sir Hugo, the one who started this whole terrible trouble,' said Sir Henry. "'He was the first to see the hound.' Holmes looked at the picture carefully, but said nothing more. After Sir Henry had gone to his room to sleep, Holmes asked me to look at the picture. "'Watson?' Does this man look like anyone we know? he asked me. I stared at the picture. Suddenly I realized the truth. Good God, I don't believe it, I cried. I was looking at a picture of Stapleton's face. Yes, said Holmes, before I could tell him what I knew. Stapleton is a Baskerville. He looks like Sir Hugo and I am not surprised to see that he has the same evil personality. Now I understand everything. I know why he wants to kill Sir Henry. If Sir Henry dies, Stapleton will receive Baskerville Hall and all the lands around it. That's why he's going to kill Sir Henry with his hound. And so we have one more answer. By tomorrow night, Stapleton will be caught like one of his butterflies. Then I shall have solved one more mystery. Soon we went to bed. Although I usually got up earlier than Holmes, 
This morning he was up earlier than me. He had sent a message to the police telling them about Selden's death. When Sir Henry joined us, Holmes told him that he had to leave for London immediately after breakfast. Sir Henry was very unhappy about this, but Holmes told him that everything would be all right. He asked Sir Henry to help us by following Holmes' plan. Sir Henry agreed to help in this way. That evening, Sir Henry would go to the Stapletons' house alone. He would tell the Stapletons that Holmes and I had stopped working on the mystery and had gone back to London. Here is the most important thing, said Holmes. You should drive to the Stapleton's house in a carriage, but send the driver away when you get there. Make sure to tell Stapleton that you're going to walk home alone across the moor. You can tell him that you want to enjoy the fresh air or something like that. You want me to walk across the moor? said Sir Henry, very surprised. But you have told me again and again not to do that. This time it will be completely safe, I promise you. Do not be afraid. I know that you are brave enough to do it, and it must be done if we are going to find out the truth. Then I will do it, said Sir Henry. But you must stay on the path between the Stapleton's house and the Grimpen Road when you walk home. Whatever happens, do not leave the path. I was very surprised by all this. Holmes had told Stapleton that he would return to London, but I did not know what I was going to do. I was worried about what would happen when Sir Henry walked across the moor that night. But we had to trust Holmes. Immediately after breakfast, Holmes and I left Baskerville Hall and went to the station at Newtown. The small boy that had helped Holmes and the moor was waiting at the train station. Any orders, sir? he asked Holmes. You will take the train to London, my boy. When you get there, send a message to Sir Henry at Baskerville Hall. Use my name in the message. Ask him to send the pocket book I left at the hall to my house on Baker Street. I began to understand some of Holmes' plan. When Sir Henry received the message sent by Holmes' boy, he would think that we had arrived in London. He would tell Stapleton, who would then also believe that we were far away from Baskerville Hall. Stapleton would think that he was free to do what he wanted. But, in fact, we would be watching Sir Henry to see what happened. After we left the train station, it was time to talk to Mrs. Laura Lyons. I introduced Holmes to her. After they had shaken hands, he said, Mrs. Lyons, I do not want to upset you, but Dr. Watson has told me everything. Sir Charles did not die accidentally. He was murdered. We think Stapleton and his wife are guilty of the crime. Mrs. Lyons jumped up from her chair. His wife! she cried. You don't know what you're saying. He has no wife. Mrs. Lyons, I can prove to you that he is married. Everyone thinks Miss Stapleton is his sister, but she is really his wife, said Holmes. He took some photographs and papers from his pocket and showed them to Mrs. Lyons. She looked at the photographs and read the papers. When she put them down, I could see that she believed us. I thought this man loved me, she said. But he has lied to me. He is just like all the other men in the world, cruel and careless. Ask me whatever you want, Mr. Holmes. I will tell you the truth. I never thought any harm would come to Sir Charles. He was a wonderful old gentleman who was very kind to me and many other people. I would never have done anything to hurt him. I believe you, Mrs. Lyons, said Holmes. Now, let me tell you what I think happened. 
Tell me if my ideas are right or wrong. First of all, Stapleton knew you and Sir Charles were friends, so he told you to write that letter to Sir Charles, asking him for help with a divorce. He told you that you should ask Sir Charles to meet you at the Moor Gate. But then, after you had sent the letter, Stapleton changed his mind. He came here and persuaded you not to meet Sir Charles after all. I did think he was acting strangely, but I believed him. Stapleton told me that he could not let any other man give me the money for my divorce because he loved me, Mrs. Lyons said. He said he was poor, but he would give all his money to bring us together. Then, after I heard about Sir Charles' death, Stapleton told me not to say anything about the letter or the meeting. He said that people would think I had killed him somehow. He scared me, so I said nothing to anyone. Yes, said Holmes, but then you began to wonder about him. She said nothing for a moment and looked down. Yes, she said. He was acting so strangely. He lied to me about wanting to marry me. So I will no longer keep his secrets. You are lucky that you have escaped, Mrs. Lyons, Holmes said. You know too much about him. But I think you will be safe now. Good morning, Mrs. Lyons, and thank you. We will speak to you soon. So, one by one, our questions are answered, said Holmes as we left Newtown. When it is over, the mystery of the Hound of the Baskervilles will become very famous. And now, the story has nearly ended. We must hope that it ends safely and successfully. Chapter 16 The Hound of the Baskervilles That evening, Holmes and I drove across the moor. Soon, we could see the lights of the Stapleton's house in front of us. We got out of the carriage and began to walk very quietly along the path towards the house. When we were very close, Holmes told me to stop walking. He took out his gun, and I did the same. We shall hide behind these rocks, he whispered. Watson, you know the house, so I want you to go forward and look through the windows. Be careful, because they cannot know that you are there. I want to know where the Stapletons and Sir Henry are and what they are doing. Very carefully and quietly, I moved towards the house. I looked first into the dining room window. Stapleton and Sir Henry were sitting and smoking their cigars, but there was no sign of Miss Stapleton. I moved round to the other windows, but I could not see her in any of the rooms. I went back to the dining-room window. As I looked in again, I saw Stapleton leave the room and come out of the house. He went to a small hut beside the house and unlocked the door. I heard strange sounds inside the hut, but I did not know what they were. Then Stapleton locked the door and went back into the house. I went back to Holmes and told him what I had seen. He wanted to know where Miss Stapleton was, and I told him that I had not seen her in the house. Holmes thought for a minute and said, This detail is very important, Watson. You shall see. But he would not tell me anything more for the moment. The moon was shining on the great Grimpen Marsh, and a thick mist was rising from it. Holmes watched the mist and began to look worried. The mist was coming up from the marsh towards the Stapleton's house. We were hidden near the path, which was on the far side of the house from the marsh. The mist is coming towards us, Watson, and that is not good, said Holmes. It is the one thing that could make my plans go wrong. As we watched, the mist, which had crept as far as the house, began to flow round it. Angrily, Holmes hit the rock in front of us with his open hand. Sir Henry must come out in the next fifteen minutes, or the path will be covered by the mist. 
Soon, we will not be able to see anything at all. We will not be able to help Sir Henry when he is in danger. We must move back to higher ground above the mist. We moved away from the house and out of the mist, which was coming slowly along the ground and hiding the path from our sight. We must not go too far, said Holmes. If we do, Sir Henry may be caught before he reaches us. Holmes sat down and put his ear to the ground, listening. Wait, I think I hear him coming. In a moment we heard quick footsteps on the path. After a few moments we saw Sir Henry. He had come out of the mist and was walking along in the clear moonlight. He walked quickly along and passed us, then began to walk up the hill behind us. As he walked, he looked over his shoulder again and again. He seemed to be afraid that something was following him. Suddenly, Holmes turned to me and said, Watson, look out, something's coming. Holmes got his gun ready to fire, and I did the same. We heard the sound of something running, but we could not see it because of the thick mist. We were about fifty meters away from the mist. We tried to see into it, and wondering what horrible thing would appear, I looked at Holmes. He was as pale as a ghost, but his eyes were bright. Suddenly, his eyes grew very big with fear, and his mouth opened in surprise. I turned to see what he was staring at. When I saw the horrible shape that was running towards us, my blood turned cold. My gun nearly fell from my hands, and my whole body froze with fear. It was a hound, an enormous black hound. It was bigger than any dog I had ever seen in my life. But there was something else that was even more frightening. This hound could not be a real animal. It was a demon, a dog from hell. Its eyes were burning red. A horrible, deathly white light covered its head and body. It was a more horrible sight than anyone could imagine. Holmes and I stared at the horrible thing. We watched as the huge, black, burning hound ran quickly and silently up the path after Sir Henry. Far away, along the path, we saw Sir Henry turn and look back one more time. Then he saw the hound. His face was white in the moonlight, and his hands were lifted in horror. He tried to scream, but he could not. He only watched as the terrible animal came closer to him. I could not imagine the horror Sir Henry must be feeling. The curse was true, and the hound was coming to kill another Baskerville. We were so afraid of the evil hound that we could not move. Sir Henry was going to die, and we were helpless with fear. Chapter 17 The Search for the Murderer Suddenly Holmes jumped up and gave a great cry. Holmes and I fired our guns together. The hound gave a howl of pain, and we knew we had hit it. But it did not stop and ran on after Sir Henry. When we heard the cry of pain, our fears disappeared. This was not a ghost hound. It was a real, living animal. Our guns could kill it. We ran after it as fast as we could. Holmes was running so fast that I could not stay next to him. On the path in front of us, we heard Sir Henry shouting for help. The hound jumped at Sir Henry and threw him to the ground. Its teeth went for his throat. But the next moment, Holmes had shot his gun. All the bullets went into the hound's body. It gave a last deep howl of pain. Its teeth closed on the empty air, and it fell down on top of Sir Henry. I put my gun to its head, but I did not need to fire. The hound was dead. Sir Henry lay where he had fallen. Quickly we pulled the hound's body off him. It was heavy and dripping with blood. Holmes opened Sir Henry's shirt and gave a sigh of relief. 
we had been just in time. The hound's teeth had not reached our friend's throat. Sir Henry's eyes opened, and he looked up at us. Oh, my God, he whispered. What was it? What in hell was that thing? It's dead, whatever it was, said Holmes. We've killed the Baskerville family ghost forever. The animal that lay before us was as large as a small lion. Its mouth had rows of teeth, sharp as knives. There were rings of blue light round its cruel eyes, too. I touched the hound's burning coat. When I held up my hand, it, too, seemed to be on fire. It's the chemical phosphorus, I said. Stapleton put phosphorus paint on the hound in the hut beside the house. That is why the hound appears to burn in the dark with that white light. But Holmes was thinking more about Sir Henry than about Stapleton's cleverness. I must apologize to you, Sir Henry, he said. I put your life in danger. I expected to see a large hound, but not a horrible thing like this. For moments we could not move. Do not worry, said Sir Henry. You saved my life, and I thank you. Please help me stand up. What are you going to do now? Sir Henry's legs were shaking so much from his terrible experience that he could not stand. We helped him to a rock so he could sit down and rest. We must leave you here, Sir Henry, and try to catch Stapleton. We shall come back as quickly as we can and take you to Baskerville Hall. Our work is almost done, but now we must find the true criminal. I followed Holmes along the path back to the Stapleton's house. We must search the house, said Holmes, but I am sure that Stapleton won't be there. He probably heard the sound of our guns, so he knows the hound is dead. The front door of the house was open. We went in and looked in all the rooms. All the rooms downstairs were empty, so we went upstairs. We found nothing and nobody until we came to one room that was locked. There's somebody in there, I said. I heard someone move. Help me break open this door. We threw ourselves against the door, and as the lock broke, we went in. We held our guns ready to fire. In the middle of the room was a person lying on the bed. There were ropes around the body. We could not see whether it was a man or a woman, because the person was completely covered with sheets. Only the eyes and nose were free. We pulled off the sheets and cut the prisoner's ropes. It was Miss Stapleton. As we untied her, we could see long red bruises across her neck. It's just as I thought. That cruel devil Stapleton has beaten her and then hid her upstairs, Holmes said. Put her into a chair. Miss Stapleton had fainted, but when we moved her, she opened her eyes. Is he safe? she cried. Has he escaped? Your husband cannot escape us, Miss Stapleton, Holmes said. No, no, I don't mean my husband. I mean Sir Henry. Is he safe? Yes, I said, and the hound is dead. Thank God, she said. Thank God! Oh, the cruel devil! Look what he has done to me! She showed us her arms, and we saw with horror that her skin was black and blue where she had been beaten. But he has hurt me more in other ways. While I thought he loved me, I accepted many things. But he doesn't love me. He doesn't love anyone except himself. He has used me. Then help us now, said Holmes gently. Tell us where he has gone. On an island in the middle of the marsh, there is a little old house, she said. My husband kept his hound there. He also had the house ready in case he needed to escape. He knows that no one can walk into the Grimpen Marsh except himself. I am sure he is there now.
Nobody could walk into the Grimpen Marsh in this mist, said Holmes, looking out of the window. The mist was like a thick white cloth covering the house. We knew we could not find Stapleton until the mist cleared. We decided to take Sir Henry back to Baskerville Hall. We had to tell him everything about the Stapletons. He was deeply hurt when he learned the truth about Miss Stapleton, the woman he loved. The news that she was married, and the awful fear he had experienced, caused Sir Henry to become ill with a fever. We sent for Dr. Mortimer, who came and sat with Sir Henry all night. The next morning, Miss Stapleton took us to the path through the Grimpen Marsh. The fog had lifted, and she showed us the sticks that she and her husband had put in to help them find their way. We followed the path through the marsh. It smelled of rotting, dying plants. One man alone could never escape the pull of the marsh's wet, thick sand without help. He would sink to his death. We never found Stapleton. We searched and searched without success. Perhaps he lost his way in the fog and sank into the marsh. Maybe somewhere, deep down, his body lies to this day. Maybe he escaped us and went to another country. One day we will know the truth. We reached the island Miss Stapleton had described and searched the old house. This place tells us a few more things, said Holmes. These bones show that he hid the hound here, and gave it meat to eat. But he could not always keep it quiet, so people heard its howling. Here is the bottle of phosphorus paint. Stapleton was clever to put this paint on the animal. After what we saw and felt last night, we cannot be surprised that Sir Charles died of fright. His heart was too weak to live through a horror like that. Selden's death was even more horrible than Sir Charles's. Selden could see the hound's shining body in the darkness, and he was so frightened that he probably chose to fall to his death rather than be killed by that hound. The old story of the supernatural hound probably gave Stapleton the idea of using phosphorus. Very clever, but not clever enough. Chapter 18 Looking Back It was the end of November, more than a month after our return from Baskerville Hall. Now the wind was cool and sharp, and the trees were losing their leaves. On Baker Street, Holmes and I were sitting next to a bright, warm fire in our sitting-room. Since our return, Holmes had been working hard on two other cases, and he had been too busy to discuss the Baskerville case. But now the other cases were finished, and he had been successful in both of them. I decided that now was a good time to ask Holmes a few more questions about the Baskervilles and the Hound. The picture showed us that Stapleton was really one of the Baskervilles, Holmes began. He was the son of Roger Baskerville, who was Sir Charles's youngest brother. You remember that Roger was a criminal. He escaped from prison and ran away to South America. Everyone thought that he had died with no wife or child, but that was not true. He had one son who was also named Roger. We knew the son as Stapleton. Stapleton married a beautiful South American woman and came to England, where he started a school in the north. Stapleton found out that he would get all the Baskerville lands and money if Sir Charles and Sir Henry both died. That is why he moved to Devonshire when the school closed. Stapleton had decided to kill Sir Charles and Sir Henry, but he did not know how he was going to do this. But when he met Sir Charles, he heard the story of the Hound of the Baskervilles. He also learned that Sir Charles believed these supernatural stories and that he had a weak heart. Stapleton went to buy a huge hound and bought some phosphorus paint to make it shine just like the hound in the story. 
I have found the place where he bought the animal. He took the animal to Devonshire on a train, and then walked many miles over the moors with it, so that no one at Baskerville Hall would see him with it. He needed to get Sir Charles out of the hall at night. At first he wanted his wife to make Sir Charles fall in love with her. Then Sir Charles would want to see her at any time, but although he beat her, she would not help him. Then Stapleton met Laura Lyons. Mrs. Lyons was weak, and Stapleton made her fall in love with him. He promised Laura that he would marry her if she got a divorce. We know that he made her write a letter asking Sir Charles to meet her at the Moorgate on the night he died. The hound, which was shining white with phosphorus paint, chased Sir Charles down the alley of trees. Sir Charles' terror was so great that his weak heart stopped, and he died. But the animal did not touch the dead body. What a horrible way to die! The hound had run on the grass, so it left no footprints, except the one found by Dr. Mortimer. You see how clever Stapleton was. Neither he nor the hound had touched Sir Charles, so no one knew that he had been murdered. There were only two people who might suspect him, his wife and Mrs. Lyons. But Dr. Mortimer told everyone that Sir Charles had died of a weak heart, so the women could not be sure about what had been done. Anyway, neither of them would tell the police about him. Next, Stapleton learned that Sir Henry had arrived in London, so he went there. He hoped to murder Sir Henry in the city. He took his wife with him, but he did not think she would keep his secret, so he did not tell her the truth. He locked her up in their hotel. She knew that he had some evil plan, but she was too frightened to give Sir Henry a clear warning. So she sent him the letter made of words cut from a newspaper. Meanwhile, Stapleton was wearing a fake beard and following Sir Henry. He needed something to give the hound Sir Henry sent, so he paid a maid at Sir Henry's hotel to steal one of his shoes. The first shoe was a new one, and it didn't have Sir Henry's scent on it. It was no use for the hound, so he put it back. And another older shoe was stolen. When the shoes were changed, I knew that the hound was a real animal, because if it had to find Sir Henry, it needed to smell him. A ghost would not need to do that. When I looked at the letter Sir Henry got in London, I held it close to my eyes. I noticed a smell of perfume, so I guessed that a woman had sent the letter. By the time I went to Devonshire, I knew some important things. I knew that there was a hound that could kill people, and it was real. I also knew that we were looking for a man and a woman. I guessed that the Stapletons were the pair. I had to watch Stapleton, but I needed to hide myself. As you know, Watson, I could not tell you what I was doing. Otherwise Stapleton might find us. Your letters were sent to me immediately from Baker Street, and were very helpful. You told me that Stapleton had once owned a school in northern England. So I checked on Stapleton, and where he had come from. I discovered that he had come from South America, and then everything became clear. When you found me on the moor, I knew everything, but I could prove nothing. We had to catch the man doing something criminal, and so I had to put Sir Henry in danger in order to save his life. Dr. Mortimer tells me that Sir Henry will be completely better after some rest. As you know, the two of them have become good friends and are going to travel together for a while. It will be some time before Sir Henry forgets about Miss Stapleton. He was in love with her, and he felt terrible when he learned the truth about her. Miss Stapleton was afraid of her husband, and she thought that he had somehow killed Sir Charles. 
She knew that Stapleton had a hound, and when Selden died, she guessed that the hound had killed him. She knew her husband had the hound outside the house on the night Sir Henry came to dinner. He knew that she wanted to help Sir Henry, so he beat her and tied her up. He probably told Sir Henry that she was sick and could not eat with them. Stapleton probably hoped that when he got the Baskerville lands, his wife would love him again. He certainly thought that if his wife became Lady Baskerville, she would say nothing. But I think he was wrong. He had been too cruel to her. She could not forgive him or love him again after he had killed people. Of course, he could not frighten Sir Henry in the same way as Sir Charles. Sir Henry was a young and healthy man, and his heart would not stop from fear. So he kept the hound very hungry. He knew that when the hound found Sir Henry, it would probably kill Sir Henry and eat him, or it would hurt him so badly that it would be easy for Stapleton to finish killing him. No one would ever know that Sir Henry had been murdered. They would think that the terrible hound had killed another Baskerville. I had another question for Holmes. Roger Baskerville was living very close to Baskerville Hall and using the false name of Stapleton. If, after Sir Henry's death, he got all the Baskerville lands and money, how would he explain who he really was to everyone? I don't know how he was going to explain his false name of Stapleton, said Holmes. Roger Baskerville was a clever man, so I am sure he had an answer to that problem. I thought for a moment and said, Holmes, the story of Sir Hugo Baskerville's death many years ago tells us about another huge, terrible hound, the first one. Do you think that hound was a ghost, or was it a real hound, too? Holmes smiled. That, Watson, we shall never know. But that's enough talking about work for the evening, Watson. I have two tickets for an excellent play at the theatre. And if we leave now, we will have time to stop at my favorite restaurant on the way. <laughs>